Well, we all, like I shared with the kids, know the appeal of something new. Maybe it's not a thing like a scooter or AirPods or a new video game. Maybe it's a new job or a new car. Maybe it's a new relationship, a new friendship. Maybe you're a part of a new group that is just exciting. The very beginning of those things always gets us going excited and happy. And for a while, that thing or that person or that group becomes the center of our lives. We're constantly thinking about them without anyone having to tell us, and we can't wait to meet with those people or that person or to use the thing that we have, because it's new. But just like the new car smell, it wears away. It wears off, and so does the excitement, and so does the constant thinking about it and yearning for that new thing and if we're honest, church, can, it can happen in church as well. It's really exciting when we come to faith. It's really exciting when we join a new church and meet new people and become involved in new things. But after a while, it just becomes a normal part of life. It's not so exciting to see those people because you've been seeing them every week for the last 10 years. But the truth is that it morphs into a different sort of joy no longer the excited obsession that knows no bounds, but rather a more mature affection, a deeper joy, and a grounding sort of love and a reality that has no end. But in our epistle reading in 1 John, John has just returned from the island of Patmos where he was exiled, and he's come back to a bunch of churches that he knows quite well. He's preached in them, he's been with the people, he views himself as sort of an elder father figure for many of these churches, and he comes back and he sees them in a distressing situation. The shiny new veneer of the Christian church has worn off a bit. The excitement has dimmed, and now in that moment, as we're all too well aware ourselves, we are now more susceptible to outside attack. And the same is true with the church. And so there was a, uh, a, a teaching, a philosophy coming from the Greeks that really separated the world into matter and spirit, which posed a lot of problems for the person of Jesus. Because we hold that Jesus is 100% true man and 100% true God. And we claim that true God died on the cross and true man rose from the dead. So Jesus doesn't really fit very well in these dualistic maxims that have been set up. And so a number of offshooting teachings have arisen in the church that are causing people to either become discouraged of their faith and they realize that, well, Jesus must not have been really man, he just appeared to be a man, Or that because Jesus did all these things, it doesn't matter what we now do in the physical world. And so they leaned into pleasure-seeking and hedonism, which is why John addresses sin being lawlessness at the end of our epistle reading today. Because there were many claiming that it didn't matter what we did because Christ has done the work, He has saved us, so none of that matters anymore. Well, the truth is we can find ourselves in similar situations. When the new veneer of our faith wears off, the joy of Easter fades a little bit a few weeks out. All your family members who traveled to be with you have gone home. The normal routines of life have started up again, and hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, hallelujah. It doesn't have the same zip it did a few weeks ago. And it is in these moments where we are susceptible to spiritual attack from the outside. Because the monotony of life or maybe the, a struggle or a suffering you're enduring can challenge your idea that the joy of Easter is real. It's faded somewhat and maybe you're dealing with a difficult and challenging circumstance. And it can be easy then for someone to convince you that Jesus maybe really wasn't all who he said he was, and that the joy you have on Easter is not really the full joy that you think it is. 
So John is writing to encourage these churches. He knows these people well. He's probably hurting. He probably knew some of the people who had left the, the, the young and growing church disillusioned by these ideas, their faith challenged and rejected. But you'll notice when you read through the epistle of 1 John, he doesn't tell them anything new. John doesn't appeal to the obsessive excitement of presenting something new. Instead, he appeals to that deeper reality, the longer lasting joy that comes with the knowledge that's already been shared with them in the gospel. And so what does he do? He reminds them. He reminds them what it is exactly that has been done for them and to them in Jesus. That's where we get this great line at the very beginning where he says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. I've always liked that phrase because it reminds me that when I was called a child of God, when you were called a child of God, it was the very same voice that said, let there be light. And so there was. It creates the reality it speaks. And that same voice said to you, your sins are forgiven. You are my child. And so you are. What an encouraging thing to hear from one of their fathers in the faith. John. But he doesn't just encourage them with that. He also encourages them with the hope that they have in that reality to face the future, like we just sang in our song today. That because he lives, now everything has changed. And not just for a little while until the shine wears off, but literally forever. No longer are you people bound to a temporal world that is passing away, but instead you have been given an imperishable life that cannot be taken from you. A new identity which carries on into eternity. No longer bound by time, you have become children of God forever. Forgiven forever. And so John appeals to this long-lasting, grounded joy in the faith of external works of God in Jesus. He doesn't come back to them and give them just a rousing sermon to excite their emotions, because he knows that won't last. He doesn't, as in some cases we might be tempted to do, to bribe in some way the reaction we would like to see, but instead he points them to the eternal abiding hope that has been given to them in Jesus. So as we get to the third Sunday of Easter, today I encourage you with these same words. Maybe like the church was dealing with at this time, you're, you have doubts that have arisen in your heart because of philosophies from the world that have convinced you that maybe you're not so sure about Jesus as you thought you were. Or maybe you're dealing with a lot of bodily and physical pain. And you just wonder, how could God allow me to endure such things? And it's causing you to lose your joy and your hope in Christ. Maybe you've lost a loved one. And the specter of death and your own mortality frightens you and makes you doubt whether or not it has indeed been defeated. It looms so large. But into the midst of all of that, we do what the church has always done, as evidenced by this letter from John we read and heard today. We remind one another of the abiding eternal joy and hope we have in Jesus. There's a reason that when you become a Christian, you don't just stop going to church. Think about that for a moment. If, if this was such a thing that you had it, you possessed it, it was good to go, you never had to worry about it ever again, why would you bother to come back every Sunday? God knew that the world would oppose him, right? And he, he points this out to them. He says, that the world doesn't know you because it didn't know him. The challenges of being the disciples of Jesus in the world are many. 
But John is pointing them to the fact that the joys are even more. Paul expresses it in the words that he doesn't even consider the sufferings of this present life even worth comparing to what he's received in Christ. And so John reminds his beloved fellow believers, and he uses very intimate familial language, little children, throughout his letter, highlighting the the effect of this new relationship we have with God, this closeness, this intimacy, pointing to the eternal joy that is ours in Jesus, a Jesus who died in our place and rose victorious from the dead, a hundred percent man, a hundred percent God, and a mystery, yet true. It happened. For there were witnesses to these things, and they have spoken, and they continue to speak. And so today, as we gathered here, the readings, the singing, the very words you share with one another serve as a similar reminder. Maybe throughout the week, your mind got focused on something besides the joy that you have in Jesus and the changing of your reality and all reality because of his resurrection. It happened. And so we gather again to point one another to the truth that we have been called children of God, eternal, abiding, forgiven children because Jesus rose from the dead. The challenges and struggles and uncertainties of this world have been completely overcome forever. Yeah, so maybe the new shine has faded a little bit, but we're going to continue to say things like, Alleluia! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Alleluia! Because those words are still true, and they're true forever. This is your new and forever reality. The world is going to come at you. It's been coming at the church since the beginning. But John encourages us today, and we encourage one another with the promises and words of the gospel that had been shared with us when we first came to faith. Stand firm in those promises of God, that he has declared you with a word that creates the reality which it speaks, children of God. And so you are. Now, there's this great line in here that I'll close with, which he says, and what we will be is not yet known. Right? Verse 2, beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. We don't know yet what will become of us when Christ returns, but we do know that it's better than anything we can imagine that the goodness of it so overwhelms whatever it is that is bogging us down, working against us in the world today, that it's not even worth comparing. And all of those things are true because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. For you, for me, for all those who believe in him, this is not some new thing that fades after a few weeks, but is true forever. And it has been given to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.